Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Jerome. And um, before I start the, the actual thing I, I was asked to do, I'm going to kind of uh, uh, react uh, to a thing that Anna said earlier about rock stars. Um, we, we don't really want rock stars around. Uh, I, I spoke last month at DevOx in San Jose, and they had this thing uh, with like our rockstar speakers. So when I did my talk there, I started explaining, well, I'm not really a rockstar, so I brought a small ukulele and I played like the first two lines of Stairway to Heaven on it. And I'm like, okay, we well, agree that I'm not a rockstar. Um, Rockstar would have guitar and stuff. I just have a small ukulele because that's the only thing they would let me get on the plane. And if I were to play the ukulele for a couple of hours, I don't think anybody would be really happy there. And beyond the joke about that, there is also that it's probably great to listen to rock stars, possibly in concert venues, because it's that, that could be a very enjoyable experience. But you don't want to work with rock stars. Uh, you don't want to hire them. Uh, same thing for ninjas. Because um, if you end up uh, hiring or working with rock stars and ninjas, what you get is a bunch of smashed guitars and dead bodies. <laughs> so for real, like that, that's what they do. <laughs> um, and in our field, it means you get brilliant jerks. Um, and there is a link here to the Netflix culture deck uh, where they explain, uh, or maybe it's an article, I don't remember. But basically, you get those brilliant jerks that always know everything about uh, everything, about every topic are kind of entitled and behave like divas or, um, and that's, by the way, that's an interesting thing that often people think as rock stars as being positive, but diva will be negative. That's a little bit sexist, by the way, but, uh, so that's why rock stars, for me, it's also a negative thing. So I like to say, well, I'm not a rock star. I just, I, I learned how to do those things just over time. I don't think I'm particularly gifted or anything, but if you if you keep talking about Docker for like three years, at the end you eventually uh, get good at it, or you do something else. <laughs> um, and also, if you have a job posting saying, "Oh, we're looking for rock stars and ninjas," it also means, well, we have all this like um, uh, ping pong tables, and um, we are going to want people who have strong egos and like to boast about, um, about their achievements. Uh, that will typically um, not make the position interesting for women and minorities who tend to be more modest about their achievements and will think, well, I'm not a rock star, I'm, I don't want that job, or not I don't want that job, but I don't feel qualified for that job. So yeah, if there is one thing that you can do, if you, if in your company there, there are jobs postings about rock stars and ninjas, uh, try to have a chat with the HR or talent team and discuss with them, um, and I have a bunch of links here. Maybe I will tweet that after if you're interested to read more about this, uh, but it's it's really super interesting. Um, and some of those talks um, were really eye-opening for me, um, in particular the keynote by Jacob Kaplan-Moss, who is one of the authors of uh, Django. Uh, that was at PyCon a couple of years ago, and he started by saying, so I'm, I'm one of the creators of Django, and he said, well, Actually, I'm just one of them. Well, actually, I was an intern when they started the whole thing, and I kind of stuck around after. So it's, it starts by explaining it's not it's not a rock star. I'm not a rock star either. Um, and yeah, that's that's all I wanted to uh, to say about that. Um, oh, and that that last thing, we need some hard work and stick to itiveness. But all we have are ninjas and rock stars. So um, you get to the. Um, level of um, comfort about Docker or anything else just by doing it for a long time, uh, studying a lot, like stick to itiveness, uh, not just because you were born with a container and <laughs> or something like that. Um, voilà. <laughs> okay, so now um, the thing I was asked to do, <laughs> um, my, my mission here is to kind of go together over the, all the things that we discussed uh, during the keynotes. Um, just in case some of you are interested by kind of doing some DockerCon debriefs uh, with your uh, local Docker communities, meetup groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I really don't want to do the keynote again first because I have 
less time and less talent than the people who went to stage and did it. And also because um, you've already seen the keynotes, so I, I don't see the point. I just want to kind of take that from a high level and then I would love it if you have questions, like if there is some specific things where you're like, I really like the keynote, but how am I going to explain that thing because I didn't really see the point or that, that's the kind of conversation I would like to have together. Um, and I will start by telling you that there are many points that myself I don't fully grasp yet um, in the sense that I have my view on the things that we presented, but I know that sometimes it's different from the message that we try to have. So I'm, for instance, for, uh, for Linux Kit and Mobi, which are probably some of the most kind of, uh, um, I'm going to say confusing, but that I want to put that in a more positive light, maybe mysterious. Um, I, lots of people are kind of wondering, hey, what are those things? Um, and it's complicated because those things are, many things at the same time. And also, for instance, somebody asked me, is um, Mobi and Linux Kit, is that a distro? And it's like, yes and no, depending on what definition you give to a distro. So the, those things are complex, and that's why I, I want to have a, a conversation, if possible, rather than just me going over things. So traditionally, the keynotes are split in two days. Uh, if it's not your first DockerCon, you probably uh, saw this, and the first day it's all about the, um, the developers, the operators, the, you know, like the, the people who, who really interact with Docker every day in their, in their job. And then the second day it's more about the enterprise. So if you're in the coding trenches and you'll go to the second day keynote, um, a lot of people could find that kind of boring and like, well, okay, why do I care about uh, Visa or whomever using Docker? There are some good reasons for that. We want people to feel comfortable with Docker, and we're trying to make those keynotes interesting and entertaining by putting a lot of work into the, the wrapping so that if you, if you are, I would say, an independent developer, not somebody in a 10,000 people organization, you won't feel the second day keynote completely boring. <laughs> But very clearly, day one is more for the, I would say, the makers, and day two um, for the, maybe the people with the money to buy Docker stuff. <laughs> so in day one, um, we, we talked about many features, um, but again, real talk, if you, if you are really close to Docker and you've been watching the change logs and everything, None of these things were really new to you because those things had been around for quite a while. So what we wanted to do is a kind of big recap to say, hey, those things are in Docker. Now you can have multi-stage builds. That, that's a recent one, but it was not like, uh, up, keynote and boom, there is multi-stage builds. Um, Docker service logs, uh, that's also a little detail, but after spending a few months in behind the, the experimental flag, now when you have a swarm, you can do Docker services log and uh, see the, the logs of your services, uh, just like you could do with Compose before. Um, the whole desktop to cloud, um, for me, that, that one is uh, a little bit in between two things in the sense that there is the cool demo of like, okay, so I'm, I, I'm on my, with my Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows thing, and I can point to a specific swarm and it works. So if you're used to the command line and to juggle with Docker machine and many environments, you're probably thinking like, what's the big deal? I've been doing that for months and months, maybe years. Um, the big deal is that many people cannot directly uh, connect to an external swarm cluster uh, because of enterprise proxy, because of uh, firewalls or many things like that. And this helps to solve that issue. And there are many things, like for instance, when we announced Docker for Mac, there was this whole VPN kit thing, um, which many people were like, what is that? Why do we need that? Well, we need that for all the people who work in that kind of work environment where um, you can't freely access the, the internet outside. You need the corporate VPN. Uh, even if you are on a conference, for instance, it happened Monday again, like I, um, for, the, for the orchestration workshops. Uh, what we do is that we create uh, VMs on EC2 and we give to people little cards with the IP addresses of the VM. 
So it's like you really need to install nothing on your machines. You just need SSH, a web browser, and you're set. Well, that didn't work so well for at least one person because their laptop, uh, I can't remember if it was blocking SSH or if they didn't even have SSH on the laptop, but that didn't work. However, they were able to use Play with Docker because Play with Docker is entirely in the browser, and so that worked. So VPN Kit um, was something to, I, I don't even want to say go around the corporate firewall because it's not going around. Um, it's more like you're told you can only go there if you wear shoes. Well, in that case, you wear shoes and, and you go there. <laughs> that, that's exactly what VPN Kit is doing. You can only have network traffic it's, if it's completely normal connections coming from a normal application running on your computer. Fine. We will make it so that Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows are normal applications running on the system instead of being a virtual machine emulator that has special access and everything, which makes it no bueno for enterprise IT. So this desktop to cloud thing is exactly the same idea, that there are many people who we're not able to uh, do all the simple things we can do, like, okay, Docker machine this, Docker machine that, I SSH to my EC2 instance, etc., etc. And so that was kind of closing the doors of Docker for many people like that. Now they can use remote swarms et, uh, and so on easily. Um, then there is the Docker ID. Uh, I, I feel like we maybe haven't talked a lot about it during the keynote. Uh, there was that thing where... Um, Christy uh, asked uh, Ryan, like, okay, so what's your Docker ID? And then I'm going to ask you to, uh, to add you to the, to the group that has access to that swarm. Um, the, the idea behind the Docker ID is to have a little bit like, you know, the, the GitHub handle. When you want to add somebody to a GitHub repo, you just ask them, hey, what's your GitHub ID? And then you add them. Um, sometimes we use our uh, Gmail or Facebook accounts to identify for stuff. Like now many, many sites, when you want to, to log in, instead of creating an account, you say just signing with Facebook or Google. And uh, that's way easier because that's not like one extra password to use. So here we wanted something a little bit like that, because sometimes you don't say, okay, I want to give you access to this Docker repo, or I want to give you access to that swarm, or I want to give you access to whatever will come up next. And we need some kind of ID. So then there is the difficult question, should we use the existing GitHub IDs? Should we use Facebook or Gmail? That probably wouldn't make much sense for something like that. Uh, should we come up with our own? Uh, we decided to come up with our own. I think there was a lot of hesitation, like maybe we should use GitHubs. Um, but we realized that there were a pretty big share of people who wanted to have Docker stuff, but still didn't always have a GitHub thing. So it didn't make much sense to tell them, oh, you want to use Docker, but first you have to create a GitHub account. Um, so that's, what, that's why we have the Docker ID. And also there is a pretty complicated responsibility thing. When you use the Docker ID to authorize somebody to use a swarm, um, if the Docker ID is actually the GitHub ID, it means that it, if GitHub has a security problem, now somebody can get access to your swarm. So in that case, in, to avoid having finger pointing, they say, okay, we're going to have a Docker, a Docker ID. And if there is a problem with the Docker ID, it's our fault, it's on us. Um, so Docker ID, I, I, I hope, feel, think that there are going to be more things around this Docker ID. Um, all the things that are related to Docker, close or far, um, will eventually kind of be tied to that so that you can be like, okay, I want to give access to somebody, I can use the Docker ID. Then, um, well, first, do you have any kind of questions, feedback, reactions? Yes. So is the Docker ID always a public Docker ID or can, also, can it also be enterprise? I think for now it's only on the public thing. Um, I, I honestly don't know uh, if we have any plans to federate that with private um, deployments. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, but if, if, if you are, if you are thinking about cases like, well, I have Docker data center and I 
Well, let me, let me rephrase my, my last part of my answer. If your question is out of curiosity, feel free to ping people from the team or like send me a message after so that I don't forget and I can try to find out. If it's more like, hey, my company or I know a company who would need something like that, then talk directly to the sales folks, basically, because they are the ones who have, will then kind of help us steer that kind of, of things. For now, as far as I know, no, then, yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first one is, um, is Docker ID very new? Or because I have a feeling that uh, my account on Docker Hub, for example, was already using Docker ID. And Absolutely. Um, the Docker ID is not quite new in the sense that that's what we had with the Docker Hub before. So we are just kind of expanding that um, to, to, to embrace other use cases like uh, the, the Swarm example that they showed on stage. Um, I believe there is stuff that you can do with Docker Cloud as well. Um, so it's, it's not entirely new. What's new is to say, okay, we can use that for everything. Okay. And the second question is, uh, to your knowledge, um, is Docker ID going to be uh, open to the public, like um, to manage authorization for other software like Jenkins and? Will it be GitHub? possible to use Docker ID like for your own stuff? Yes. I believe we want to do that. Um, I have no idea if it's like if, if we started on that project or if it's more like on, on the roadmap or something. Um, but well. For instance, play with Docker. We want to integrate that with Docker ID. And so we've been having like tons of technical conversations around that. And I have I don't know if we will end up doing something kind of custom um, or if we will find a way so that Docker ID can be a OAuth or whatever provider and that play with Docker will use that. But yeah, the long goal is to make that available so that if you build some cool stuff that is um, Docker-centric, like let's say you do your own security scanning or whatever, then we, we ideally we want you to be able to leverage a Docker ID if you want. Yes. Uh, what you mentioned earlier about the uh, Docker service logs uh, seems to me to be a great deal of overlap with Docker Compose, and I'm trying to figure out is is that just it's a minor overlap, or is there a plan to kind of push or deprecate Compose and bring everything into Docker service? Um, I I'm not sure I heard everything because of the echo, so I'm I'm going to try to repeat. You you asked if the Docker service logs does that overlap a little bit with. Docker Compose, is that the question? It seems like yeah. it does. And, and so the question is, is, is Docker Compose therefore deprecated or? Oh, I see. As I can now Docker service create? Right. I mean. Are we deprecating Docker Compose? No. So um, today, when you do Docker Compose up, you're, you're still creating old school containers in the sense that if suddenly this Docker Compose, like you pull the plug, the containers are going to continue to run. But if one of them stops, it's going to stay stopped. Now, if, if instead of Docker Compose up, you do a Docker stack deploy, then it's going to create services, and those services are going to continue to run forever. What I would dream of would be the possibility to do like a Docker Compose up, I don't know, dash dash service or dash dash stack or something like that. And that would um, do, the, do a Docker stack deploy, and then a bunch of Docker service logs so it would look exactly like Docker Compose up, except it would be services behind the scenes instead of normal containers. Uh, for now, we have, we have no plans to uh, deprecate Compose. Maybe in a few years, uh, ones that we will see because it's honestly, um, will we have more features in the Docker CLI that eventually will kind of supersede Compose? Or conversely, maybe it would be better to break things down in multiple components. Um, there have been lots of discussions around that. Of, um, and uh, lots of people I've been thinking slash dreaming about maybe it would be nice when if you do docker build it would in fact call a docker build binary um, so that you can upgrade your builder without having to upgrade the whole CLI or engine st stuff like that um, so for now we, we are not deprecating compose and if we end up doing so it will be because there is a, a perfect replacement like maybe at some point you will be able to do Docker space compose space up and it will behave the same way. I don't know. 
thanks a lot for those questions, by the way. That's, that's exactly what I wanted. So more questions or I continue on the next. OK. So then there is the, a lot of things uh, around SwarmKit. Um, and again, if you, like, for instance, I do the orchestration workshops, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, subscribed to all the changes happening on SwarmKit and then how they make their way into the Docker engine. Uh, so there, is, there was nothing really new, like secrets, mutual TLS, cluster segmentation, encrypted overlays. Um, most of these things were already in my workshop since maybe November or something like that. Um, so again, it, it's not like, hey, look, new feature. It's more like, well, we have a bunch of features that have been around for a while. Um, now we think they are pretty stable, so we are going to put them on stage. And uh, for the people who have missed the last few episodes of the show, we are going to catch up. Um, so those, those features, there is, there is a super strong commitment to security. And uh, I'm going to tell a very short story. Uh, I, I did the big mistake of signing up for a talk that will be in a couple of months where we are going to demo uh, basically Skynet. Uh, you know Terminator? Uh, there is like this evil uh, artificial intelligence that wants to kill all humans uh, and sends Terminators to the past to, to do stuff. I'm not spoiling too much. <laughs> and so what we want to do is basically create Skynet. So we want to create a program that will run on a swarm, and that program will try to hack into other computers, and it will try to gather money and stuff by various means like phishing, scamming, stuff like that. It's going to be on a small scale. Don't worry too much. Uh, we are not reaching singularity yet, hopefully so. Um, but we want to do this kind of demo, and uh, we want people to interact with it. It's a tall order, so that's why I say it was kind of a bad idea, because I don't know how we're going to pull that off, but we're going to try anyway. Uh, and with a system like Swarm, you have manager nodes, you have worker nodes, and if, you, if you're trying to take down this um, Skynet thing, if you can hack into manager node, then it's like, um, a pretty sure headshot you will be able to take down the swarm and humanity wins. However, if you get into a worker node, there is almost nothing interesting you can do. The, 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 your best chance is to find out that, oh, there is a container running on that host that has access to a secret uh, that will let me do things. But even that, that might not help you because um, let's say, uh, oh, this is the MySQL database password. That's great. But how do I connect to that MySQL database, which is on a different node? I have to set up an overlay network. Uh, if I went to Laurent's talk yesterday, did a black belt talk about like, how do you set up your own overlay network? So if you, if you saw this, you know how to create your own overlay network, kind of to uh, insert yourself inside the, the thing that has been set up by Docker. But if encryption is enabled, that won't work. Um, so the, that's a huge uh, thing in, in SwarmKit, this kind of uh, uh, minimal privilege story. Uh, that means that, uh, unfortunately, we might be contributing to the downfall of mankind uh, because uh, AIs will be able to run, like, uh, IAs will be able to, no, I can't remember if it's AI or IA in English anyway, because in French it's always the other way around. Um, anyway, computers might end up building a very resilient system. Um, and uh, sometimes we can't help but feel like, like, do people really care about all this? Maybe we, we, we put a little bit too much effort into that security story. Um, but eventually, at, at the end of the day, and you probably heard that plenty of times, uh, security cannot be an afterthought. It means, we spent a lot of time building those security features instead of building like automated canary deployment or things like that. Because um, b adding those security features later would have been very hard. I, I won't say impossible because nothing is ever impossible, uh, but it would have been really hard. Uh, now that we have this super strong foundation, we can add fancy features um, like have a built-in blue-green deployment system, um, have some auto-scaling tightly integrated with metrics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, so that, that's a bunch of features that are very security oriented. So again, for a lot of people, for, for lots of people, it's like, that's great if you're the enterprise or if you are some big company that has credit card information or something like that. Um, but do I really need that for smaller stuff? Not necessarily, but what I hope is that if you are a developer or an ops person, or if you are working with them, I hope that eventually your app will be successful, that we have tons of users, and that security will matter to you. Because even if you are just, um, look, Moby Bingle, the thing we use so that people could kind of get together to talk about stuff. There is not a huge security thing around that. Like if I can hack around Moby Mingle, I can see that uh, Bob and Jane decided to get together to talk about IP tables. Uh, that's not a lot of really personal information. But sometimes you can go a little bit further than that because maybe if you can hack into the Moby Mingle thing, then suddenly you can get people's email addresses, phone numbers, um, things like that, maybe pictures because they put their pictures so that you can recognize people. And when you have a, a huge leak of information like that, it's always bad because there always end up being something in there that you wish was, wasn't there. Um, so even if today you're like, well, that Docker security thing seems to be a little bit overkill, it's like, well, it's, it's there. So the day you need it, you, you just have to dive into those things and, and, and it will be there basically, which is better than, oh, I, I really need to work on security because now I have uh, the date of birth and you know a bunch of things that could be used as security questions. Uh, so I really don't want to be hacked. Uh, unfortunately, I chose to deploy on something else and they don't have the same security features, so I have to port my stuff or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm not saying you should use SwarmKit, otherwise you will get hacked. Uh, but I'm just saying that's why we put so much effort into the security story, because we want like the day you you need like super bulletproof security, you just have to open that box that's next to the Christmas tree and that says open once you have one million users or something like that, and the security features are gonna be there. Yes. As has the security been audited? Um, there, are, there, are, there have been, um, so every quarter, I think, we do a kind of global audit, both of like Docker processes and, um, you know, like from office security access and things like that, uh, all the way to uh, some specific parts of code. Uh, I don't know if, I mean, I, I, I suppose some parts of that have been audited in, in the scope of this. But I don't know more specifics. But if it's something, if it's an important question, I will be more than happy to uh, put you in touch with uh, Nathan McCauley or uh, Diogo Monica, and they will be able to tell you exactly uh, we did audit this and this, but not that and that. But we will do it at that point, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, which makes me think about um, uh, a mentoring tip that went to my mind when uh, Anna was speaking. Uh, one thing that helped me a lot to admit that I don't know about things is when I know who knows. <laughs> uh, and I think that's, that's the thing I, I got from that, from my dad when, he, when I was a kid. He used to tell me, well, just ask me if I don't know, I know who knows. And, and now that, I mean, when you ask a question like that, it makes me feel at first uncomfortable because I'm like, I don't know if we have audited that thing. I know we have stuff in place, but specifically, however, I know the security team, I at least know their names <laughs> and I can, put people in touch and then they can have that kind of conversation. Um, another, another tiny anecdote, uh, yesterday I met with somebody who was working on a, on a really cool um, mechanism uh, to get AWS IAM uh, roles and credentials into containers uh, so that you can develop locally and be able to assume IAM roles. I know every single of the words in those phrases so I kind of understand what that means but I am completely um, not in any position to give feedback or have an opinion about is that good, is that bad, did you do the, the right thing or not. However, um, Laurent, the, the, one of the Black Belt speakers, is super deep in AWS. So I just like put those two persons next to each other and let them talk and, um, and that's it. So sometimes as a mentor, 
you don't know, sometimes you have no idea, you barely know what the other person is saying, but if you can at least figure out the context, um, the, the more you grow in the community, the more you will know people who will know that kind of stuff like super deep and you can connect them and that's also part of being a mentor, I, I, I think. Um, okay, other questions on the security side? Yes. Mm-hmm. Kind of blew you away, but uh, are you? Would you think that that might, stuff might be integrated into uh, overlay networks or in the engine itself? Right. Do I think that Cilium um, might end up being integrated in overlay networks? I honestly don't know. Uh, they have a plugin, so in a way, it's like you can start playing with it already, and um, with Linux Kit and Mobi and all that stuff, it means that we can kind of um, smooth the rough edges about the kernel requirements and all that stuff. I, I don't know. Uh, for instance, when Andre, who did the IPVS talk um, a couple of years ago, did his talk, I secretly I was hoping, well, if, if we could use IPVS in Docker, that would be dope, because IPVS is, is really outstanding for that kind of load balancing. And so, it, you know, you send like a, a bunch of emails to the team sometime to say, hey, we had that conversation with those Russian folks and they say use IPVS, they suggested we use IPVS for load balancing. Uh, back then it didn't get much traction, which was fair because it was just basically me saying, hey, do we want to use that cool stuff that um, I was told about by a bunch of Russians when we were getting drunk in a bar in Moscow. So that's, that's not how you push new technology. <laughs> Um, but then eventually we got Andre to come and do that talk, and that that was the the thing. And I I wouldn't say overnight, but suddenly IPVS was on the radar, and uh, Madhu and his team kind of for them it was a logical solution. Yeah, we're going to use IPVS because it's stable, uh, it's in the kernel in the kernels <laughs> for for a long time. Um, so for Cilium, I. I honestly don't know. I, I know that the, um, the network team has uh, their, their eyes on this. Um, so perhaps, <laughs> perhaps it will be a plugin. Perhaps, it perhaps we will use little bits of it. Uh, the same Andre was telling me yesterday, you, you should think about replacing all the, the, the IP table rules with like um, uh, the eBPF and, and things like that. And I listened for a while, and at the end I said, well, I didn't think I would say that for a network question, but I have no idea. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. Um, maybe it would be great, maybe it would be terrible, because now when you want to debug stuff, instead of doing IP tables dash L, you're like, hmm, some of my network traffic magically disappears in eBPF, and how do I debug that? So I, I don't know. Um, I'm excited about it and I'm excited that we have plugins because it means that even if we end up not doing anything with it, it will still be a possibility out there. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Um, then, mixed architecture clusters. So, of course, the, the demo we had uh, involved Windows and Linux because it's kind of the more like and mind-blowing thing, uh, but for me, the actual mind-blowing thing uh, will be to have a mix between uh, Linux on Intel and Linux on ARM, because recently I started to tinker with Raspberry Pis, and I found it super enjoying and fun, uh, and I really want Docker on a Raspberry Pi to be just like Docker on my Mac or my Linux machine, um, so the fact that we're getting closer to multiple architectures, that gets me really happy. Um, there is a talk that I will absolutely watch once we have the videos. Uh, it's the talk by uh, Chrissy Perez and Chris, I can't remember his last name, from IBM, uh, from ARM to Z, where they explained like, the work they did uh, to have Docker uh, on uh, on those exotic platforms and what it means and how you can run um, Pi binaries on your uh, OS X machine, uh, which is like a completely weird thing because it's a different operating system, it's a different CPU, it's like, what, how can this even work? So there is a lot of emulation and magic involved, um, but 
that that that's also for me a big deal. F for me, because I'm excited about Raspberry Pis, but as I always say when people ask why should we care about ARM and architectures, I say, well, we all have one of those in our pocket and they all have an ARM CPU. All, I mean, almost all of them, I think. Um, so that's why we care about the ARM platform too. I'm not saying that you will be able to run Docker on this um, like tomorrow or even by the next DockerCon, but it's something that some people are thinking about. And this whole IoT thing, uh, that's, that's also very often running ARM CPUs and running containers on that has many, many, many applications. Uh, specifically, uh, you, you know, like all the cable or DSL boxes that we have. Um, so you have like this box that simultaneously uh, does like the cable or DSL modem, but it also has like TV functions and maybe telephone. And TV now is being, is being fancier and fancier because you can like record programs or you can like uh, see the, the, guide view and all those things. So that requires a small computer in it. And an increasing number of people are noticing that um, the gaming market is pretty big. It's actually bigger than the movie market. And it all goes through a little box that is usually made by Microsoft, Sony, or Nintendo. And I'm, maybe I'm forgetting a few because I'm completely uh, not aware of what's new in the gaming market. But what if you are um, AT&T or Comcast? So basically you have the power to put a little box in almost every uh, American home and that little box can be used for gaming. Um, well, there are many implications around that, but containers can be a huge um, technical advantage for that. Like if you, if your DSL or cable modem uh, were able to run games. So at first, maybe not like the crazy games that they do nowadays. Um, but start with something simple. Um, and using containers for the isolation between the different applications. Uh, this is something that people are thinking about. I, I, if I remember well, it was in 2015. I had a conversation with people from Orange in, in France, uh, because they wanted I mean, they wanted to think about having Docker on their next generation um, box. I have no idea if that ended up uh, happening or not, but they were really curious about how can we make that happen? What are the blockers? And support for multiple architectures, one, one of the big things uh, in the way. Um, questions or reactions about support for multiple architectures? Yep. You may have already thought about this, but uh, the Linux kit, the multiple archi architecture, sounds to me what you're describing about the um, in-house, you know, either routers or cable boxes. Yeah. If uh, Comcast, let's say, took advantage of that, they could then send you updates much easier, or you could choose what parts of their system you wanted, and they just build and send it to you in one um, ISO order, whatever. Absolutely, and, and that's an excellent segue into Linux Kit. Um, so I'm going to kind of stash that question for a bit, just if people have other questions about the support for multi-arc. Nope. All right. So the Linux Kit and Mobi were, I think, for many people, the, the most kind of what's going on here moments. Um, and there is nothing to be embarrassed about. For from my personal tinkerer perspective, those two announcements are simultaneously like all and nothing um, in the sense that it's a little bit like that one of the best comparisons I found right now. It's a little bit like if you time travel to 1995 and you make a huge announcement, hello, this is the Linux kernel. Um, so, and then you're like, okay, we have the Linux kernel. What are we going to demo on stage? Are we going to show a web server with Apache? Um, are we going to show um, a diskless workstation with like Netscape back then and all that stuff, but completely diskless, so silent and everything, which back then was a huge deal. Um, are we going to demo, I don't know, what can we do with Linux, like fun things like uh, running multiple sessions from different people at the same time, or um, you could pick like one million different apps, uh, but 
if, if the people you're talking to know what is a Unix kernel and you can explain, well, so now we have a Unix system and it's kind of stable and it can run multiple things at the same time and there is decent memory management. Um, so it's something pretty close to Windows NT but with a smaller footprint and it's free and uh, there is a text mode and et cetera, et cetera. Um, if, if you can speak with those words, it's, it's kind of easy to explain what it is. But for the people who don't know what it is, you can tell them, hey, that's a kernel. What's a kernel? OK, so that's the bit of the computer that takes care of the drivers. What's a driver? Oh, god, we're not, we're not there yet. So here, the challenge with Linux Kit and Mobi is that we, we feel like we're having something like that. And we want people to tinker with it. But we don't, we don't know exactly what, what it's going to be and what people are going to do with it. My personal kind of, uh, remember at the end of the demos, it was like, we can project number one, we can project number two, we can project number three. It was many examples of all the things you can do with Linux Kit and Mobi. Uh, and perhaps it will turn out that most of those examples are not at all what people want to do. Uh, and they will come up with completely different ideas that we had not even imagined. For instance, my personal, uh, I would say, weekend project, uh, if I wanted to, to start one around um, Mobi and Linux Kit, would be, well, I want to uh, make a, a Linux app uh, and have a Docker file and everything. So it's like something you build, like the, the perfect normal container. But then I want to be able to turn that into an MSI or a DMG, which are inst install formats for uh, Windows and um, OS X, respectively. So that from my machine, I, I just test like from my Mac or Linux machine, I build my app. Maybe it's a little web server and you can connect to it and do stuff. I don't know. But at the end of the day, I get an installer that people can run on their machine and install my program. And it looks like a normal program, maybe a .exe on Windows and a, an app on OS X. And when they run it, um, it behaves like a normal local application, even though it's a Linux, it's some Linux code running in a container uh, with this whole uh, Linux kit thing around it. Um, I would find that fun, um, mainly because I, I lost track of the number of times where I would have some friend who like ping me saying, hey, um, can you help me? I have this 10,000 lines uh, Excel file that I need to convert in various ways and find the, the anomalies in it. And I would like, yeah, let's, let's do that. Not because I get excited about data processing, but because I get excited about the idea that thanks to a little bit of scripting, we are going to turn like four days and nights of mindless like scanning the Excel file for mistakes and everything into maybe a couple of hours of coding and running scripts because that's, that's, that's the thing I really like. Uh, avoiding like the, tedious grunt work and having some little clever scripts instead. That's how I ended up here, basically. Um, and very often, I would end up at some point explaining my friends, that's how we are going to install Python on your Windows machine, on your Macintosh, uh, so that you can run the script yourself, because I, it's stupid. We're not going to, like, you send me the, the file, me running it, sending back the results, and, and repeat and repeat like that. It's, it's dumb. Instead, I'm going to... Um, mentor you so that you can install Python, explain to you basically how it works, and that's how we're going to work. So having something where I can turn any program uh, into something that could run anywhere, I find that cool. Uh, so that would be my weekend project with Linux Kit and Mobi. And as you pointed out, um, it could be also be a good solution when you are working on embedded slash IoT slash so some things like that, and you want to ship to somebody something a little bit like a firmware, but the firmware is often all or nothing. It's like, yeah, that's a, this is the firmware for your uh, maybe phone or your uh, set-top box or whatever. You can't really add and remove things from a firmware. I mean, yeah, technically you can if you're, um, if you're one of the very few people who are comfortable with cross-compiling and super crazy tool chains, et cetera, et cetera. But normal people like me can't add and remove things from firmwares. So now if we have something like Linux Kit or Mobi, 
um, we can easily build firmwares that have a bunch of things um, and kind of easily add and remove components. So that would be another uh, very good example uh, for, for those projects. Um, I would rather take your questions rather than uh, continue to kind of ramble on about Linux Kit and Mobi because I feel like the more I would talk about it, the more I might end up confusing you. <laughs> Um, but I would be really happy to, even if your question is like, this thing doesn't make sense or whatever, uh, that, that's the part I think which will be the, very interesting to discuss because um, we heard the feedback from many people like, we're not sure exactly what that is. So we want to discuss and clarify. And um, so does anybody has a, yeah. So, um, in summary, can we say uh, if you have an image or if you can build an image, mm -hmm. go f go with an image and don't worry about Linux Kit and Mobi and create your own Linux operating system. Like the Redis example was a little confusing. Uh, Redis is available as an image, right? Why would I build a Linux bootable installed on Linux using Linux Kit and Mobi, right? So. So in, in summary, how can we, how, use case wise, how can we differentiate it quickly? How can we differentiate, you mean, between? Like if, say, if, uh, the example that was shown in the, in the keynote was Redis, right? But Redis is avail uh, also available as a Docker image. Uh -huh. You can put it on Swarm and get up and run oh, it. Oh, okay. Right? Why, why would I use um, Linux Kit to Mobi. build a kind of Redis OS exactly. instead of just running an image? And right. Right. So in the case of Redis, that will be a little bit, um, is there a word in English, you know, like pulling the hair to mean it's a little bit dubious. <laughs> uh, but yeah, for just Redis, you, you could say, I'm going to use that to build a Redis appliance, which is probably not very, not very useful per se. Um, except I, I could see a scenario that is a little bit exaggerated, but that kind of gives an idea. Let's say I have um, uh, some, something that will be a, a counter but it has to be a really, really, really high performance thing. Um, I'm using that to generate serial numbers or whatever. Uh, well, of course, no, I would use something like Snowflake or whatever, but let's forget that. Uh, so I want to use Redis, and I will just have clients that will connect, and basically they will increment the counter, so that gives them the new value of the counter, so everybody will get a different value for the counter. And I want to have thousands of requests per second, millions of requests per second. And then at that, immediately when we get into that scale, it's like, wait a minute. We need to have potentially um, millions of packets per second going to that machine. So we are already kind of hitting the wall in the network performance thing. Um, so they are, at that point, we're like, hmm, can I maybe uh, have a very minimal system I'm going to be using uh, DPDK, for instance, uh, which is a framework where instead of having the, the kernel doing the TCP and everything, you just have the kernel giving you the network buffers, and then you have an application that can do whatever it wants with the network buffers, which means you end up re-implementing the TCP stack uh, entirely. But you can, and in some scenarios, it can be really useful. For instance, in that case, you could use a special TCP stack that only lets you connect, send a query, get the response. Because all you want to have is this increment request in Redis. So you will likely never have any connection that will be more than one packet in each direction. So you use that special TCP stack. Um, you can even uh, have a slightly tuned Redis to make use of that. And then suddenly, you can achieve that level of performance. You can get in a completely different um, domain, performance-wise, uh, because instead of going through all the usual steps, like this is user land, there is a TCP connection, and the three-way handshake and everything, and now we have lots of kernel user transitions and everything, and when you look really at what the CPU is doing, uh, you're shocked because it, it's like spending time moving pages around, changing context, and like, oh, we're in kernel mode, but we have to go to user mode. So we put everything on the side, and what does the kernel do? Uh, increment one thing in memory, and, and generate a response and go back. So 
I want to say the machine is probably doing 90% useless things. So if you could shave that off, you could go 10 times faster. So that's a, that's a slightly kind of weird example, but it's, it's not that far-fetched in the sense that um, if, especially when you think about unikernels, one of the problems that people have with unikernels today is that, right, that's, that's great, that's a unikernel for Nginx or MySQL like we showed last year. Uh, it's cool, but um, generally you want a little bit more than that. You, you want next to MySQL, you want maybe to have some tools, um, you want to be able to connect to get some system metrics or whatever. So being able to build something that is a, a little bit more than a unikernel, um, but at the same time is not a full-blown machine, um, can have some value there. So the Redis example is a little bit like the, the unikernel examples last year, when there was like Nginx in the unikernel and MySQL in the unikernel. It's more to show, look, we can do it, but we also agree that there is no direct application for Nginx in a unikernel or Redis OS built by Linux Kit. Did, did that answer your question or? Yeah, so, so um, from, from an understanding or explanation perspective, uh, I just wanted to understand, or I, I just wanted to understand scenarios when to build an image and when to build your own OS, right? For example, if you're building a Swarm Master or a Swarm uh, Worker, for example, that's a good example where you shave off everything else, mm -hmm. you, you've just built a worker with minimal minimal footprint and you put it in Amazon, and Amazon supports the Linux kit in Mobi, you can say, okay, instead of using AMI, give me a Swarm worker. So in, when, I'm, when I'm provisioning a provisioning a cluster, I can say I need three Swarm masters, which are specialized mm -hmm. OSs, and I need 10 workers, which are specialized OSs. But if you need Redis, anything which is application or something of that sort, go and use images, and do not think of using your own yeah, you. If you if you need, um, yeah, it's 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 more or less what what you explain. Yeah, um, if you you generally want to have container images because it's so easy to make them and build them, and they've been around for three four years now. So okay, we're starting to know what we're doing. And little by little, we say, okay, now we're going to be able to also maybe uh, build DMIs. Um, and there are some scenarios where it will be super useful. Um, let's, say, let, let's say you build the new, the new ETCD. Like it's not ETCD, it's using a new protocol. Um, and you, you build something with that. And maybe there will be an interest for you to offer an AMI that is kind of unikernel-like in the sense that it's super small uh, and so it will boot super fast and it won't be encumbered with a million things. Um, but yeah, basically you, you would like to have a Docker image but that can start as an EC2 VM. Then that, that would be a great use case. Okay. Other questions? From my point of view, Linux Kit is more clear, but about Mobi, uh, I have heard implicitly it was told that uh, Mobi is inspired, Mobi movement, let's say, inspired from Fedora projects. So do you see the similarity or how do you comment on that? And uh, how will it differentiate? Uh, oh, saying that so Mobi um, is inspired from the Fedora project, is that the question? Yeah, do you think, uh, and if not, or uh, how will oh. it differentiate, or what will be right. the Right, so, um, this is mostly for the governance side. So it's not to say, oh, Bobby wants to have RPM, et cetera, et cetera. It's more like there is a specific governance model around the Fedora project, and I honestly uh, don't know that very well. But for instance, I'm going to make up stuff. It's like, well, in the, in the Fedora project, there is a Fedora leader. That's true so far. And that person decides about this and this, and then there is a committee to decide about that. And when people disagree about technical stuff, it's decided like this. So we decided to get inspiration from that 
process from, from the way the Fedora project works uh, because we think that it's good for what we want to do for Mobi. I, honestly, I don't know exactly how the Fedora project works and how that maps to Mobi. Um, and I was not at all involved into those discussions. Um, but the, the idea is we looked at how Fedora works from, uh, I don't want to say political because it's kind of negative, but more like the high level process. And we thought, well, that's going to be good for Mobi and, and, and Linux Kit, so we're going to use that. Do you see what I mean or? Okay. Okay. Um, and then a few things about the day two keynotes. Well, the day two keynotes, as I said, is mostly about the enterprise. Um, so uh, what we wanted is to have uh, customers with uh, familiar names, reassuring names. So for instance, before when, when people ask me, okay, but is Docker used in production anywhere? I would have to tell them, well, um, there is a maker of uh, small rectangles of plastic that almost everybody has in their wallet. And I hear that they're using Docker. And, and I, would, I could not say anything else because uh, I think before that keynote, we are not really allowed to say anything about that. Um, so by saying just that, it lets people wonder like, well, it could be Visa, MasterCard, or Amex, but it could also be Oberthur or the, the companies making the card themselves. Uh, so now we can say, well, there is this, uh, you know, little things of plastic that we use to pay for stuff. Um, one of them is using Docker to move money around. Um, so it's not really interesting for us directly. It's not like, a, and again, uh, when we do, um, we, we would love if people do, you know, a recap of the keynotes. But we don't want you to be like, and then the, um, I can't remember if it was like the VP infrastructure or whatever from Visa came on stage and said that they were super happy about Docker. No, that's not the point. The point is that now when people are like, yeah, but is there any, any Soyuz user that has Docker? Then you can be like, yeah, Visa is using Docker. And if you want to know more, you can check the keynote and there will be that Visa guy who will say very nice things about Docker. Um, so that, that's what the second day keynote is all about. It's, it's not about the developers and, and the ops. It's about um, the enterprise who wants to be like, okay, I'm going to, to spend a lot of money on that Docker stuff because I believe it's going to help me eventually to make even more money because that's what enterprises are about. Um, but I want confidence uh, into the fact that I'm not doing a bad choice. And very often enterprise is like, yeah, I would like to use that new thing, whether it's Docker or virtualization or the cloud, but I don't want to be the first one because if I make a mistake, everybody's going to say, oh yeah, we told you that this cloud thing would never work. So a lot of uh, enterprise users need to have that kind of um, uh, reassurance that, yeah, other people have been using Docker or the cloud, so now they can do that as well. Uh, same thing about the certified ecosystem and, uh, for instance, the fact that Oracle is putting images on the hub. Uh, I had one of my friends tell me, like, what the hell does that mean? You are being friends with Oracle now? I said, wait, wait a minute. Not everybody at Oracle is evil. Uh, their legal department is not as big as that. There are also tons of really great people at Oracle. Uh, but joke on the side, um, it's not about uh, being friends with Oracle or whatever. It's, it's about showing that companies like Oracle, which are not by any means small or uh, funny guys or whatever, uh, serious companies, boring companies, so to speak, with lots of money behind and everything, are like, yep, we are putting our stuff on the Docker store. It's a kind of uh, seal of approval, if you will, uh, a little bit like, I don't know, if you manufacture tire, if there is like BMW that says, we are only using the tires from that person, then you can be like, hey, look, we're the real deal because everybody, maybe nobody knows my brand of tires, but everybody knows BMW and BMW trust us. So um, again, I'm, we're not asking anybody to parrot those things. It's just like when people ask you, yeah, but is this Docker thing really serious? I don't know what you can say. Well, those people trust Docker, and if you want, you can check the 
keynotes or whatever to, to see exactly what they say about it. Um, so yeah, so, and, and same thing for the last thing, the MTA, which means um, it's really late and I should be ashamed because, well, I don't know what, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's the fact of, yeah, modernized traditional applications. So it's taking um, traditional applications. So generally that means like the, you know, the old monolith or even worse than that and putting that in containers. And there is the whole idea of lift and shift, uh, which I really visually imagine like the, you take the monolith and you lift it and you put it in a container and then you close the container and you're like, let's not look at that anymore. <laughs> um, and I was a little bit surprised at some point myself, to, to be honest, when I saw the, the first things, I was like, wait a minute, you're telling me that we're going to take that image to Docker thing, we are going to get a Docker file, build a thing, and that people will want to deploy that. That doesn't look very Dockerish to me. Are you sure you want to do that? Because I don't feel super comfortable around it and everything. And then I, I had a flashback to almost 10 years ago when I used, I can't even remember the name of that product, but it was something you would run on a Windows server and it would run for hours and hours and hours. And at the end, you get a VMDK, like a VMware image. And it's a VMDK of that server. And, I, and back then, I was uh, in the process of taking some old NT servers for a company and putting that on a bunch of Xen servers. Well, two Xen servers for redundancy and having, I don't know, half a dozen NT servers and old Linux servers and everything. The Linux servers I can do. The Windows machines, I am completely helpless. So I was like, oh. and then uh, my friend tells me, well, have you heard about blah, 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 P2V something. And I'm like, oh, what is that? Well, it's this magic program. You run it, and at the end, you have a VM image. I'm like, uh, what's the catch? <laughs> like, there is no catch. It's, it really works. Just run the thing. And it did. And I think um, probably actual Windows persons would have, um, like, um, stroke me with a stick or something for doing something like that because I just took this empty machine that I didn't want to touch and I put that on a VM and then I pretended that the work was done. And actually, yeah, the work was done. Uh, maybe a, a real professional uh, would have reinstalled the apps or done something like that, I don't know. But at the end of the day, the, it, it was there, it worked, and as far as I know, today it still works. So here, it's kind of the same idea. For many of us, if you're like, I'm going to have a generated Docker file that kind of maps to your application. And if you look at a Docker file, and I think most of us have written Docker files and have like handcrafted things so that the build is nice and clean and everything. So if you look at a Docker file, it, maybe it won't be as nice. Maybe the caching and everything won't be as optimized, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that somebody who barely knows Docker can use those tools and get started with uh, traditional apps and run them in containers. Um, and then later, if they are so inclined, they can refine that. And, and for their new greenfield apps, then yeah, of course, they will write nice Docker files. But this will let them put those things into containers, and that's what they want. Um, so that's, that's why this thing is such a big deal and why we were talking so much about it. Um, any questions on the enterprise side of things? Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of my VMs are. So, unfortunately, a lot of my VMs have multiple VMDKs. So uh -huh. the image to Docker support handing you a series of VMDKs. So. Because um, so, in the example they showed on stage, they took a single VMDK and made a Docker image from it, and right. then made the Docker thing. A lot of our VMs nowadays have you know been grown over years, and there are a lot of, more than one VMDK. You, you mean if it's multiple VM or if it's a one VM no. with multiple disks? Yeah, multiple disks, um, one VM. So honestly, I, I don't think that image to Docker currently supports multiple VM DKs. But what I would say is if those, if the extra VM DKs are just like data disks, uh, it should be really easy to transform that into a volume. And I, uh, I think it's Rex Ray by EMC. They, they have a driver that allows you to use VMDKs as, um, as volumes, um, mostly for like local dev stuff. But I think um, eventually 
that will come also for uh, production and heavy load usages. Now, if it's if it's something more complicated where it's like, well, I have this VMDK, but then I have the equivalent of I don't know mounts or whatever. Um, perhaps we need to do like one pass to transform them into one transform that into one big VMDK. I I don't know for sure, but I my 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 gut tells me that there has to be a, a relatively easy way in the sense that the the hard job uh, has been done. Like uh, Jake Nikolov, I, I think, is the one that mostly did the, the whole image Docker effort. Uh, did all the the really tedious thing to kind of how do I squeeze out that VM to to get a Docker file? So then, if we have multiple, I mean, I'm going to say between quotes, if the problem is just that we have multiple VMDKs, I'm sure we can apply good old techniques to to make that fit into the the funnel and and get it to work. Other questions? Yes. So um, this is about uh, the ecosystem um, Docker on Red Hat. I heard some things about Red Hat changing the basic image structure, or changing the Docker, and Docker saying we'll be supporting only certified version on the Red Hat Linux and not the community edition. Like, what's the play there? Um, can you just be a little bit um, louder? Because I okay. so you said something about Docker and Red Hat so, and certified so version. Docker CS, uh, the community edition, is not supported on Red Hat anymore. Is that true? And um, there were... So there is some... some Complications around that in the sense that when you when you you install Docker and I can't remember if it's Docker or Docker IO I can't remember the exact name of the package, um, but you end up with the version that has been patched by Red Hat, and um, we we had a few times the problem that some of the patches by Red Hat would break other stuff, and sometimes on the security side of things, so. We were in this really difficult situation where, on the one hand, we don't want to kind of start an argument with Red Hat because they are partners and contributors and everything. But at the same time, it also harms us a lot when people say, well, OK, so there is this security issue in Docker. Uh, well, it's not on Docker. It's on the Red Hat version of Docker. And when it gets really bad, when we do commercial support, and people are not running the Docker upstream that everybody is running, but that special patch. Um, so we, after taking a lot of time to think this through, we decided to go kind of the, the hard line, which is, well, uh, if, you, if you want to call that Docker, then it should be the official thing. And if you, if you think that something is bad in it, um, if it's features, then yeah, maybe we can argue forever. Uh, should Docker have that feature or not? Uh, if it's security, you can be sure that we will fix it really fast. Uh, honestly, because just like if, if they point out, oh, Docker has this security problem, we will fix it. Be just because otherwise it would be super embarrassing for us. Um, but I, I agree that if it's about features, like for instance, oh, we would like to have support for uh, like specific support for systemd features or etc. And it can be like, oh, OK, so we possibly the maintainers uh, can like discuss forever. And then Red Hat, or not only Red Hat, but the people who want that feature could be frustrated and say, I'm just going to add the damn feature because I need it. We try really hard to not end up in that situation. And uh, when, when I, th I think. Was it on a slide here that I saw, like, yeah, I think it's Sebastian who said, think in use cases, not in solutions, which means when somebody says, hey, I would like to have a flag uh, to support, like, whatever, or like, no, what are you really trying to do? What is the, the real reason for that? And I have in mind a few examples about some of the systemd related things where there was a bunch of pull requests about, hey, we, we want to add that feature and that other feature and this. But the real reason behind this is we want to be able to log to journal D. And once that this became clear, we're like, OK, no problem. Let's write a journal D logging driver. 
and well, it was not done overnight, obviously, but once we know exactly the use case, uh, then we can find the, the best solution for that. And uh, the the bottom line is that I, I want I want to say and I want to stand by this that fine, we can argue forever about how we are going to implement feature X Y Z, but if somebody has a legit use case like we want Docker to be able to do this because that that's what we're trying to do, we will make it happen. Um, maybe it will take some time. Maybe again we will argue about how. Um, so that's why we decided to have the hard line of okay, no, you can't call it Docker if it's not the upstream Docker. And so that's why if you are running uh, on RHEL, if you are using the um, Docker by Red Hat, you can't get support from Docker because it's it's not what we're building. Um, I don't know the last episodes of that show. <laughs> I, I believe that we are converging to something to, to solve that. Um, but that's the big picture. However, ah. you can install um, Docker now it's Docker EE, and then you get to perform Docker just fine. Okay, like are they are those at least compatible? For example, if a developer is using Docker Community Edition, building an image, running it, testing mm. it, and putting it on Red Hat, and it breaks, like are there any such scenarios? So are, are those different Docker's compatible? On the image level, they should be. I mean, I would be really shocked if there were like a, an image built with. Um, that yeah, that would be super shocking, especially when you think about the fact that you can still run images that date back from Docker 03 or 04, something like that, when we started to add push and everything. Those images still work today. Um, so uh, on the image level, we should be fine. Um, we are working really hard to make sure that there is no difference between CE and EE. In fact, in the engine itself, currently there is no difference and we don't want to have differences. Um, so again, I want to say, don't worry, there will be no, no compatibility issue, which means that if you find some, I, we want you to tell us about it and then that's going to be a high priority issue. General questions about life, universe, and everything? <laughs> 42. Oh, there one. So my question is kind of add on to him, and uh -huh. I didn't, it was actually one of the questions I had about um, Red Hat, it's not Red Hat, but CentOS. We use CentOS, which, you know, of course, Red Hat controls and upstream is related. I've had that bug that you've talked about three times because Red Hat has backported the, the bad code, let's say, and then the new release of Docker on Red Hat resolves the problem, but it has caused some you know, issues for us on like three occasions. So is the solution just to use, not to use the Red Hat version through Yum and just to compile Docker yourself? Um, or the other way around it is I've used the mainline kernel and that solved it for mm. us. So, um Normally, we have packages that have been built specifically for CentOS. So, no, uh, and uh, I've done this experiment recently. Um, I had this, this friend who wanted to get started on coding, generally speaking. And so I, I had done a um, tiny repo with a compost file that basically brings up a PHP web server and a little sample code, and, and you can literally go to play with Docker and copy paste three commands and you have your PHP playground. And then she told me, okay, that's fine, but now I want to run that locally because if I understood all the stuff you explained about Docker, I, I could run that on a Docker machine, so I want to run that on my machine. But it's Windows and it's uh, before Windows 10 and uh, IT and everything. So she ended up uh, having a VM, like a CentOS VM, and installing Docker in it with Yum. And then I th I can't remember exactly what was the problem, but I said, okay, I'm not sure what's, if, what causes this because I, I didn't even have access to the machine. Uh, so all I could do was ask her, run those commands and tell me what happens. And it's in a VM and I think she hadn't the, um, 
you know, the, the guest tools that allow to do copy paste the VM. So that was like super painful. So I said, okay, let's try to install like the, the Docker, the Docker version, the, sorry, the Docker Inc. version of Docker <laughs> uh, with, for, for CentOS. And, um, the docs explain very clearly, yeah, you need to add that YUM repo and this, this certificate and this and that. But I was, honestly, I was feeling kind of bad about this because it's like the, the, the experience is not great. Um, so I was, I tried to find what's the easiest way, like the, the shortest path to victory. And that turned out to be just download. I think you have two RPMs to download and you RPM dash I them and then you're fine. Um, so we ended up doing that. It worked. I don't know if it worked because of a problem in, in the Red Hat option thing or something else because, well, in the process, we removed the Red Hat thing and replaced with the other one. But it ended up working, which is all I wanted uh, and she wanted eventually. So, um, the, but in, in the process, I saw, okay, we have CentOS packages and they are relatively straightforward to install and that's what we recommend to use. Does that, okay. Uh, honestly, in, in the long run, I want us to be able to resolve those things so that when you yum install Docker, you end up with the good thing and then everything's gonna be rainbow and little birds and happiness. <laughs> More questions? Going once, twice. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
So as you can see here, the program is where we onboard student leaders on campus and provide them with support and materials to help them bring together students who are interested in, use, develop and support the Docker eco ecosystem. Um, so essentially, we're, the aim is to have a, this wider group of students and give them all these um, benefits. Other benefits include discounts to community events such as DockerCon, um, uh, priority access to product betas, things like this. Uh, but then the real goal is to train these Docker campus ambassadors to become like a Docker expert on that campus and they will become the go-to person for all the other students. Um, so essentially what we need from you guys um, is mentors for the Docker Campus Ambassador because although one of the requirements is that they are already familiar with Docker, we don't expect them to already be an advanced user. Uh, our promise to them is that we will get them there. So we want to provide them with training, both uh, technical but also professional training. So technical in terms of using Docker and uh, other ecosystem um, solutions, but also uh, professional skills such as maybe public speaking, speaking skills, resume skills, things like this, um, help them make connections with uh, other companies and people at, at Docker as well, internships, things like this. Um, so, we need your help with the following things. We're looking for mentors to be paired up locally with campus ambassadors, uh, help them with their own learning journey, help them teach other students, um, even help them plan events. We don't, one of the requirements um, to become a campus ambassador is not to have had a, event planning experience before. So maybe some of them have actually never even planned uh, an event or a workshop so they could even do with some assistance in, with that as well um, and then the other another idea that we had um, Karen and I talked to Sebastian a lot about this was that we think it would be nice if students could get into groups and work on docker projects and Sebastian's going to outline kind of like a menu for students to pick from and they'll work throughout a semester on a project and it would be nice if we could have mentors to guide them through that through that journey um, and basically be available to answer questions and also attend in-person events. So Karen and I will send out a poll later to see which mentors would be interested in helping students and then I will, I'll make the connections at a local level via email. Um, but I also have, if any of you know students or um, are already kind of helping students that might be a good fit for the Campus Ambassador program, then I can give you a card to give to them um, with the URL to sign up to that student community and uh, do the application for the Campus Ambassador program. It's not very strenuous, it's just they have to write kind of 500 words about why they want to be a Campus Ambassador and what they want out of it. And uh, Obviously they have to be a student and um, an enthusiastic and passionate person is really the main thing that we're looking for. So yeah, we'd also like your help in recruiting more campus ambassadors as we grow the program. So that kind of concludes this mentor summit. Um, the next steps are if you're not already part of the mentor group. Oh, sorry, you have questions. Not middle schools and high schools, no. Universities, yeah, colleges. Yes. No, worldwide. Yes. Can you repeat the question, please? What classes are we talking about? Higher education means university level colleges. Bachelor's, master's, yeah, yeah, any um, level at university. So undergrad, master's, PhD. I mean, ideally we'd like undergrad um, because if you're PhD level, you're probably already pretty advanced and you could be a mentor, I guess. Um, so undergrad would be better, but uh, it's open to any students. Yes.
Yeah. Well, that's my job. So um, that's what... Oh, he's asking how um, we will make students aware of the program and aware of Docker. So um, next week, actually, um, we're planning to launch a blog post, which will explain everything about the Docker and higher education program. Um, And then we'll promote it socially as well. Um, I'll reach out and send the blog post on to all my contacts at various universities. And then if you guys can also send that on to any contacts at universities, um, and we'll go from there. And then I'll make the the connections um, when I get the applications in. Any other questions? Sorry? How many hours? Oh, um, I mean, that's not really something I've... I'm going to give a strict um, kind of limit on, but we do ask, I don't know, I'd say if you could meet them in person at least once a month um, and then be available online, um, it's really up to you, but obviously the more the better. And it kind of depends how active the campus ambassador is as well and how much help they need. So it's kind of hard to say what the time commitment would be. But you have to be willing to actually go in person and meet them and go to workshops and like go to the university. So it's not just online, it's it's in-person mentoring as well. Any other questions? Okay. Um, and if you do think of a question that you forgot to ask, um, I can also give you my business card with my email address on it as well. So, okay, to wrap up, you can join, or please do join the Docker Mentor group online. That's how we communicate with you guys and where you can get all the latest information from us. And then also we are looking for mentors who attended DockerCon to go to local meetups and give a talk on their experience at DockerCon and go over the highlights and give a recap. So if any of you are interested in doing that, we can make the connections with the organizers and that would be really awesome. Okay, thank you very much.